example, when uh, doing the contemplation earlier this evening, when we were trying to <coughs> look for a painful feeling in the body, then uh, sometimes it, um, what we find is that the the closer, the harder we look for something, then the the more elusive it becomes. We have this kind of naive uh, perception, this naive expectation that um, uh, if we don't know something, we just have to sort of learn a little bit about it, look at it, and then it'll become clear to us. And somehow if we just sort of uh, do that enough, then we'll understand it. But actually the mind doesn't quite work like that. If you think back to that experience of uh, trying to look for the painful feeling in the body, then it kind of seems to want to run away, doesn't it? Yeah. You try to pin it down and it runs away. So it's like when, when you don't want it, then it hunts you down. Yeah. <laughs> you don't want it and, and it'll do anything to try to catch you up and throttle you. Yeah. You can't escape it. No matter where you go, where you turn, where you run, where you hide, you can't get away from it. But then as soon as you turn around to face it, it's not there anymore. Or maybe it kind of is there, but it becomes kind of ghostly. It sort of dissolves. kind of weird, isn't it? But it's a bit like, like if we have the um, you know, prejudices you know, in a, in a, in a, or likes and dislikes in a worldly sense. You know, so as humans, we tend to... Um, <clears throat> uh, one of the ways that we kind of cause... We make our lives interesting is by, by defining ourselves and people like us as friends and other people as enemies. And so a lot of all the kind of the good stories in history books come from that kind of thing, don't they? Yeah, we say this group is white, that one's black, therefore these are good and those are bad. Or, or we say this one's a black and those ones are white, therefore this one's bad and that one's good and whatever. Or one's yellow and one's red or whatever. And then man, female and Catholic and Protestant. That's one, that's one that's really good because the, if you look at Catholics and Protestants, you realize that actually they believe almost exactly the same things. Yeah. <laughs> There's not hardly any difference between them. And yet they uh, kind of at each other's throats in Ireland and other places for many years. So there's a bit of a joke about that. Would you like me to tell it? <laughs> As Sister Hui Khan says, if you've heard this before, please hear again. So this, there was a man who was standing on a bridge looking down below. He's about to jump off. And another man came along and said, Don't jump! He says, Why shouldn't I jump? He says, But he says, aren't you a believer? Don't you believe in, in God and, the, and, the, and the, the life beyond? He says, Yes, I'm a believer. He says, Well, I'm a believer too. He says, well, what faith are you? He says, I'm, are, you, are you a Protestant or a Catholic? He says, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Protestant. He says, what are you? I, I, well, so am I. I'm a Protestant as well. He says, what are you? Are you Anglican or Lutheran or, or what, Calvinist or Uniting Church? He says, I'm, I'm, I'm an Anglican. He says, I'm an Anglican too. You see, we're brothers. We're just the same. He says, but are you... Are you Reform Anglican or pre-reform Anglican? He says, I'm a post-reform Anglican. He says, oh, so am I, brother. He says, are you post-reform of 1987 or post-reform of 1962? He says, I'm a post-reform of 1962. He says, 1962? He says, get, jump off there now. <laughs> so that's a bit what... Uh, Religions alike, isn't it? 
So we want to try to define ourselves. Into, uh, there's another joke about religion. Do you want to hear another one? <laughs> The rabbi and the priest had a car crash. <laughs> Smash. There you go. Two cars demolished. All right. It's terrible. All right. Tragedy. But miraculously, they both survive. They crawl out of the wreckage of their respective vehicles. And the, the priest sees the rabbi. He says, oh, my brother, are you, you, are you all right? And he says, yes, I'm all right, my brother. And are you all right, my brother? He says, yes, I'm all right, my brother. <gasps> God is great, is he not? And they run to each other and hug each other, sobbing and crying and laughing. God, is what a, this is a miracle. We've both survived. The, praise the Lord. And then the, um, the rabbi says, my brother, he says, hold on one minute. And so he crawls back into the wreckage of his car. And the priest calls out, what are you doing? He says, wait on a minute, my and then you hear this cry from the middle of the car. You say, God is great. Praise the Lord. And he comes out with a miraculously undamaged bottle of whiskey. <laughs> and the priest says, oh, the Lord is good, is he not? All kind and merciful. And so the rabbi uncorks the whiskey and hands it to the priest and says, please, my brother, you look, sh you look shaken. You know, you've got a, you're, you're, you're in shock. Please, please, have, have, have a sip. Can't steady your nerves. So he has a sip and steadies his nerves. He says, please, 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 look, you look, you're starting to shake. Please sit down, have some more. And so the um, priest has another good sip and then he gives it back to the rabbi. The rabbi says, no, 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 my brother, look, you look, you're, really, you're turning pale. Sit down there, please, have some more. So by this way, he finishes off a good half of the bottle, gives it back to the rabbi, he puts a cork on it and sets it aside. The priest says, but my brother, aren't you going to have some? He says, no, 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 that's fine, thanks. I'll just sit here and wait for the police to come. <laughs> so this is, uh, interfaith is a glorious thing, isn't it? I should have saved that up for the philosophy night, shouldn't I? <laughs> Anyway, a taste of things to come. There'll be more of that if you come for the philosophy night. <clears throat> so anyway, where was I? Oh, yes. Humans. Strange things that we are. Aren't we, aren't we curious yeah, to define ourselves in this kind of way? By, by, we have to find some kind of other to project our enmity upon. A bit pathetic, really. But there you go. And uh, mm, of course, you know, it's, it's interesting to reflect in that way because there's this, there's there's always parallels between uh, like external, or collective, or social behaviour, and then. Uh, inner behavior in our minds. Yeah? We tend to do the same kinds of things. It's not exactly the same, but there are these parallels. And so when we, we, we relate to the other in that way, defining ourselves as separate from them and at least potentially in conflict with them, then we've diminished a part of ourself. Okay? Why is that? Because... Actually, because there is no other. Right? That the idea that there is another itself is illusion. Now, this is not some kind of mystical doctrine or anything like that. This is a very straightforward psychological fact. As we sit here right now, we have this idea in our mind. We think there's a bunch of people sitting in a room. Right? But that's not an experienced reality, is it? We don't actually experience the reality of what we do is we experience a sight. Okay? What do we see? Do we see people? Not really. You don't actually see people, do you? What you see actually is colour. Yeah? So as we sit here, what we see is patterns of colour. That's all our eyes can tell us. Our eyes can't see people, right? Eyes can only see colour or light, or whatever you want to call it, wavelengths of light. 
right? That's all we see. The rest of it is made up in our minds. Yeah? Similar with hearing. All we hear is sound. Yeah? The rest of it is all made up in our mind. So our, our, our mind puts together this particular sight together with that particular sound and then adds a memory into it, yeah? mixes it all up, bakes it, <laughs> and then produces it and said, hey, this is a person. So I recognize, oh, this is this such and such a person, that's such and such a person, and it's the same person as I saw last week or the week before or whatever. Actually, there's no person that you're experiencing. What you're experiencing is simply sights and sounds okay, and thoughts. And the sights are yours and yours alone. So don't blame me, all right? <laughs> all right? So I might be sitting here looking as ugly as hell, but that doesn't matter. That's not my fault. It's your fault, right? <laughs> it's your sight, yeah? The ugliness is in you. It's not in me. When we see, right, what is, what is it we're actually seeing? Actually, that, that's, that's a pattern of light and so on, but that's a pattern of light which is actually specific to this point in space, isn't it? Yeah? Same patterns of light is not found in any other point in space. Only right here, at this moment, are these patterns of light manifesting in this way. Okay? And so this is entirely personal. Everybody else has a different experience, a separate experience. We assume. We assume that everyone else has a separate experience. We don't know that, right? This is a very famous philosophical problem, which is the problem of how we know that other people have minds, okay? And it's not at all obvious, right? We've grown up since we were, were children, assuming that because we see these things, we call humans or people, that therefore they have an inner life which is roughly comparable to the inner life I have in here. And of course, that's a very kind of reasonable assumption in terms of, well, behavior and so on and so forth, and it seems to be very similar. But actually, we don't know, right? If you want to be skeptical about it, maybe I'm the only one here who's conscious. I know I'm conscious, right? I'm not sure about you lot, right? But I'm conscious, and so maybe I'm just sitting here in this room talking to myself, in which case I'm feeling a bit silly right now. <laughs> But at least I'm enjoying it, so that's all right. <laughs> so, uh, are you in fact conscious? Yes, we are. You are? We are. You're with me? You're with me? Okay, that's good. <laughs> but how do I know that that's, you're, that's a conscious person saying that and it's not just my own delusion saying that? But then that's just a touch, isn't it? Yeah. Oh. oh, that's ridiculous. I mean, come on. <laughs> come on. I mean, be reasonable. <laughs> so, but that's it, isn't it? You know, actually, all these things are true, but, but we kind of be reasonable and, and pretend that it's not actually like that. In fact, we don't really know. So it's not actually based on what we know, it's based on what is kind of convenient, it's a convenient assumption, yeah, to assume that other people are conscious and so on and so forth. Hmm. So, but one thing that that's useful for, to reflect on that, in a way that's, that's very kind of philosophically abstruse, but one thing it's useful for is to give us a certain humility, okay, in terms of understanding other people, yeah, and often we're very quick to judge. We're very quick to say this person's like that, that person's like that. Yeah? And in fact, what we're aware of is this tiny, 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 tiny little bit of what that person is. Yeah? Tiny, tiny, tiny little thing. Yeah? A reflection of an echo, of a memory, of a glimpse. That's all we ever know of another person even though we might be married to them and live with them for our whole life. Yeah? That's all we ever know of them. And what they experience of themselves inside is so much vaster and more complex and more nuanced than anything that we can see from outside. Yeah? And if we have to be honest, we, don't, we can't even know that they are conscious. 
right? Still less can we know really how their mind is, how they feel, what they think, all of these kinds of things. <clears throat> and so we're very, very quick to judge those things. So we should have a certain humility about that. Yeah? And so this is why it's always good to try to um, uh, you know, do that, that, that kind of basic uh, but, but very profound exercise in compassion is to put yourself into that other person's place. Yeah? How do they feel? How would, how would they feel in that situation? And so, of course, what we can try to guess is how would I feel in that situation, if I was in that situation. And we never really know yeah, how they actually feel because they're different than us. Yeah? But we can try. So this is what compassion is about. It's about actually saying, what is it like to be inside their shoes? Yeah? Would they pinch? Are they high heels? You're falling off them? What is it actually like to be standing in their shoes? So this is that exercise in compassion. So when we, when we, uh, <coughs> when we um, divide people up and we say, you know, uh, Catholics are good, Protestants are bad, or we say, you know, it depends where you are. You know, if you're in Australia, you, you say, you know, Australians are good, Kiwis are bad, or something like that. Poms are bad, whinging poms. These kinds of things, or if you're in Thailand, you say Thais are good and Burmese are bad. Strangely enough, or if you're in Sri Lanka, you say Sinhalese are good and Tamils are bad. Or if you're in, everyone's the same, isn't it? It's kind of, it's a bit boring. So, in each case, you're actually talking about a part of yourself. That's the actual reality. A bit of yourself has been, you've cut off a bit of yourself, dissociated a bit of yourself, so you, where they use in psychology. You've dissociated a piece of yourself, you've defined it as the other, and you've erected a wall in between yourself and the other. Yeah? And this is like, like the Berlin Wall or something like that, the Iron Curtain. It's all very sad, isn't it? And so that, that process of opening up to others of accepting is a process of uh, expanding who you are, expanding the possibilities of who you are and integrating aspects of yourself which previously were denied. Yeah? And so this is why it's very important. It's very important from a uh, personal perspective, from a social perspective, from a world historical perspective. It's very important that we do this and we continue this process. And this on the social level is mirroring that process that's happening on the inner level. Because just as we are on external, when we're looking at people, we tend to divide them, we tend to alienate them, we tend to, to draw lines. Same thing we're doing in our mind. Okay. And so there are parts of ourselves that we don't want to know. Parts of ourselves that are mean. Parts of ourselves that are cruel. Have you got any cruel bits inside yourself? Delighting in hurting others. Actually, actually causing pain to another person and enjoying that act of causing pain to them. Rejoicing in the fact that they're suffering. It's sick, isn't it? Yeah? It's kind of monstrous. Speaking of monsters, of course, I'm sure you're all aware of the terrible case in the last week or two of the, the, um, the uh, Austrian basement prison thing and I saw an interesting uh, interview with the guy, what's his name, Fritz or something like that, who actually did the thing, kept imprisoned his daughter for how long, 20 years or something like that in the basement and uh, he did this interview, it was quite amazing, it was in the Guardian a few days ago, if you want to have a look at it, and he was saying, I'm not a monster, people have been misrepresenting me, I'm, I'm not as bad as, as, I, as, as people thought, see, I took them to the hospital. That was how I got caught. Yeah? I took them to the hospital. I could have killed them. 
Yeah? I could have killed them, but I didn't. So I'm not a monster. It's pretty amazing, isn't it? Yeah? At least he's not suffering from low self esteem. <laughs> but isn't that, I thought that was very, very remarkable because it's like, well, if he's not a monster, then who is? Yeah? And then the answer is, well, nobody is. Yeah? Because a monster is, the idea of a monster is something that we just make up in our minds and we project that on the other and we say that there is the capability of somebody to be purely evil. Whereas, in fact, it's not the case. And it's not the case that that man was purely evil. He had good parts and he has bad parts. The bad parts were a lot worse than most people, but that's all. It doesn't mean that he didn't have good parts. We can't accept that. Okay? It's difficult for us to accept that, to take into case that somebody can have so much evil, so much cruelty, yeah? and yet not be all bad. But in fact, it is true because that's how the mind works. The mind is that complicated. It is that contradictory it is that paradoxical that he could do all of those unspeakable things for such a long period of time and yet still have compassion yeah he still had compassion still tried to save life so he's not a monster And those same tendencies, of course, are, are within us, right? So we all have those tendencies towards cruelty. So this is why we should never be judgmental in these kinds of things and should never seek to try to punish. That's a really big thing, isn't it? That's really hard. But as soon as we condemn somebody or a part of ourselves as a monster, then they're really locked away. They're kind of shoved away in the basement and we're not even going to think about them. We're not even going to look at them. We're going to deny them, pretend that they're not there. And that's a bit sad because they're not that bad, okay, the monstrous parts of ourselves. Actually, if we don't have the fear, we can face them. Yeah? You can even have a laugh at them. Yeah? And you can look at, that time when you were being cruel and you think, oh, okay, yeah, that was a cruel thing to do. And that's all right. Let go of it. Yeah. You think of that time you were selfish and you think, hmm, that was selfish. Well, I'll have to be more generous next time. That's all. Yeah. And so we shouldn't kind of linger on these things. Okay. There's no point in, in kind of um, uh, having this kind of sense of guilt. And this is, one of, of course, one of the problems... Uh, coming from a, a Christian-based society is that we tend to um, uh, we tend to have this thing called guilt. So not all of you are brought up as Christians. So it's a bit. bit I think I think we tend to experience this in a slightly different way. If you've if you've been sort of had Christian or especially Catholic conditioning from a young age, and I might say to the, on this that I think that the Catholic Church. And the Christians generally probably changing to a significant degree in this regard. They're certainly not as bad as they used to be. And they used to sort of consciously try to inculcate as much guilt as possible. And, uh, uh, you know, and uh, so some of the stories of that I was really kind of outraged when one of the, the ladies who was part of the group, Patty, would tell me when she was at school, at a Catholic school in South America, that they would divide the class up into three heaven, hell, and purgatory, okay, when she was in primary school. And all the good little girls got to sit in heaven. All the bad little girls had to go to hell. <laughs> and kind of the medium ones were in purgatory, and that's how they were brought up. And I was, I was really shocked by this. I thought, God, how can they do that? And I told my dad this, and he said, oh, yeah, that's what we did in my school as well. <laughs> And they had a place in their, they had a place in their, their uh, school, the Catholic nun school, they had a place called The Thing. Right? And The Thing was the, the bottommost dungeon pit in the whole building. And it was dark. And you had to go down the stairs. And it was dangerous. And The Thing, if you ever lost anything or left it lying around, a jumper or a pencil case or something, 
and the nuns would take it and they would put it in the thing. <laughs> and you had to go into the thing all by yourself in the dark and recover your lost item and you never, ever did it again. It worked, yeah. The girls didn't leave their pencil cases lying around and they were psychologically scarred for the rest of their lives. Yeah, that was fine. <laughs> so, yeah, these things do have a certain effectiveness to them. <clears throat> so, we have this thing called guilt and the difference is that guilt wants to punish, doesn't it? Yeah? So, guilt isn't merely saying something's wrong. And guilt is saying, I did something wrong, therefore I am a bad person. I am nasty and evil and I deserve pain. I deserve to be punished. Yeah? And uh, they even do that. I had a friend who was a, uh, um, uh, had been a Catholic monk. And uh, he later disrobed and became a Buddhist monk. But when he was a Catholic monk, he used to whip himself. Yeah? So this is what they do, and they're still doing it today. They would get a whip and in the evening, 50 lashes or whatever it is, and uh, to, to, well, whatever they were doing it for. But, you know, this is not, uh, from a Buddhist point of view, not a very healthy state of mind to be in, to be whipping yourself. So uh, that's not in Buddhism. You have a, have a sense of of what we call remorse, which is slightly different from what we call guilt. And remorse is uh, when something you've done something bad, then there's an acknowledgement of it. So it's a knowledge. Yeah, it's not an act of punishment. It's an act of knowledge. And knowing things um, helps us to to let go of them. <clears throat> and this actually is very interesting. That there's, there actually is a power through naming things and acknowledging them in our mind. When, when something is unknown or unnamed, then psychologically it's, it's, it's a bit threatening, it's confusing. Our mind likes to, likes to have things in order. Yeah? And uh, it's as if we tame things. It's almost like a magical power. You know, in, in, in magic, like if you know the, the true name of something or somebody, then you can, you can have power over them. Yeah? This is a classic magic kind of trick, is you get the, somebody's secret name and then you can do spells and so on. You have a power over them. But that actually reflects how the mind works because when we have the name of something in our mind, we, it's as if we, we understand that we can control it to a degree. And so our mind is, is, is um, comfortable around that. Just that act of naming it and acknowledging it. And so this is what that thing of remorse is, is a kind of knowledge. Okay? And it's a knowing of that thing. Okay? You know, oh, okay, I did that. And of course, that's not particularly joyful in itself. That's why it's called remorse. It's not a happy word. You know, okay, I did that bad, bad thing, and there may be some pain there. Yeah, it's just natural. There might be some pain in that remorse. But you're not kind of adding to the pain. It's just, it just stays that. Okay? And then once that dies away, then it tends to most of the time it goes away, and then your mind will be very clear. Yeah? And so always the the act, the response to that is not to punish. The response to that in Buddhism is to say, ayating sangvarisami. Okay, this is what the, the phrase that the, the monks and nuns use when we're doing our fortnightly confession. If we do anything wrong, we confess uh, offenses or if we've broken our vinaya, we say, ayating sangvarisami, I will restrain myself in the future. Yeah? And so this is the thing, is just not to, to dwell on the past, but to say, okay, from now on, I'm not going to do that again. Okay? I realized that was wrong, that caused me pain, it caused others pain, that's all right. I've acknowledged that, I've known it, now I can move on, go into the, and uh, do the right thing in the future. So we don't have to be uh, afraid of uh, the dark side of ourselves, the shadow side of ourselves. This is okay, it's very natural. We should know it. Okay? We should not not know it. And we should not pretend that it's not going to be there because it always is there. Everyone has it. Okay? We don't have to go necessarily hunting it down. right? We don't have to go on obsessing about it. But to know it's there 
and to acknowledge it when it appears. Oh, okay, it comes out in this way. It comes out through that particular unskillful speech. Yeah? It manifests in these particular unskillful actions. Yeah? We can know it, reflect. Where was that coming from? Oh, okay. Hmm. And then you can let go of it and then move onwards. Sometimes uh, it requires us to uh, heal some kind of relationship with others as well. Maybe you say something that's unskillful, speak in an unskillful way with somebody, and then afterwards you reflect, that wasn't right, I was acting out of greed, hatred and delusion. I've got to say sorry to that person. And so you, you, say, you ask for forgiveness. Okay? I'm sorry, I shouldn't have spoken in that way. I realized that that was hurtful. I realized that that was inappropriate in those circumstances, then please forgive me. Okay? And this is very, very healing. It's very powerful. It's amazing. It's amazing how powerful that is. It doesn't, doesn't take anything that's too dramatic or too um, uh, um, too too sophisticated or anything like that. Just to take a moment. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Yeah? And this is a very very powerful way of healing oneself. So sometimes that's required. Sometimes it's not required. Okay. If it's not required, then you just say, okay, that's it, and you just get on with life, and that's good enough. All right? So always remember this thing, that, that, that the, the way of Buddhism, the path of Buddhism is a path of knowledge. Okay? It's a path of awareness. That path will be of awareness, sometimes bright things, sometimes dark things. Yeah? In each case, we're just aware. Yeah? That awareness itself... Will the, but the awareness itself is bright. This is the difference. Yeah? Bringing the light onto the bright things, the happy things in life, will increase them. It will, there will be a feedback process that will grow. The more we pay attention to the happy things in our life, the more we pay attention to goodness, the more we pay attention to kindness, the more we pay attention to peace, the more we pay attention to letting go, all of those bright dhammas, then that will grow and grow and grow. The light will grow more. But when we pay attention to the dark things, if we pay attention to nastiness, if we pay attention to cruelty, then they tend to diminish. Yeah? The light of awareness that's brought to those things will tend to diminish the darkness. This is the difference. Okay? So our job is the same. Our job is to just be aware. And as we're doing that, we're aware that while paying attention, being mindful, being careful, that the bright side will grow and the dark side will diminish. There's a very good story <coughs> once, uh, and this is a story in the time of King Ashoka, and uh, um, there was a fellow called uh, Upagupta who was a, at that time was working in a shop. This is before he ca became a monk. And um, <coughs> one of the monks knew that, knew that he had the um, capacity to, to, to ordain and to become a great monk, so he tried to persuade him to ordain, but he wouldn't, didn't want to do it. He said, my mind's too impure. I've got too many bad thoughts, and I can't train my mind. Here I am working in a shop. I'm busy all day. I, can't, I don't have time for meditation. So he said, okay, if you don't have time for meditation, here's what you do. You get a pot with black stones and a pot with white stones. Every time you have a bad thought, you put, a, 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 you, you, you put out a, a black stone, and every time you have a good thought, you put out a white stone. That's all. And that's all he had to do. So it's not an exercise in judging or condemning or trying to do anything, just to acknowledge, okay, this is a bad thought that goes there, this is a good thought that goes there. And when he first started, big pile of black stones at the end of the day, yeah? <laughs> and he's so kind of worried about his work, he's stressed, he doesn't like his customers, blah, 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 the boss is on his back, he hasn't got the thing, oh, uh, and just one white stone in there. Yeah? Go, oh, okay, well, there's a little white stone there. And the next day, almost all black and three or four white stones in there. And it kept on going, just like that, little bit by little bit, until at the end, after a few weeks of doing that, just a pile of white stones, yeah? no black ones. Then he went forth, he became a monk. Yeah? So this is a very, very beautiful story because it shows how simple that is, that it's not, spiritual practice is not about anything that's too dramatic or that's unachievable. You know, if we say to ourselves, 
I want to become purified. I want to become an arahant. I want to become fully enlightened. I want to become free from birth, aging, and death. I want to realize the true nature of existence. And it's like, whoa. <laughs> Man, you know. But if you want to say, there's that bad thought in my mind. I'm not going to think that. You can do that. Maybe even that's hard. You can't do that all the time, but sometimes you can do it. You can at least have that one white thought in the daytime. Yeah? Even if all the rest are black, you can have one white thought. If you can do that, ah, then that's a start. Yeah? And you know that. And the knowing itself is another brightness. Yeah? The knowing itself is brightness. That's the trick. That's, that's really the clue. The black dumbers and the white dumbers, whatever, but the knowing of that is the brightest of all. Yeah? And this is the way, this is the path. So this is my little talk for this evening on black and white and knowing um, the good and the bad. So I offer this to you for your reflection. And I'd like to invite if there's any comments or questions.